kings and priests. <laughs> you are a royal priesthood. I want to tell you your true identity. Somebody's been messing with your identity. Somebody's been trying to tell you who you are. This is who you really are. But I am here today to tell you who you really are. Listen to this scripture. It's in the, in the Bible. When you read something in the Bible, you know that it is true and you need to apply it, believe it in your life. You look in the mirror and you begin to tell that face that you're seeing in the mirror who you really are. Listen to this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. There you are right there. A holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow. You're not in the dark, you're in the light. So when you get in the light and you look at yourself through the light of fellowshipping with Jesus Christ, you begin to see who you really are. You are a royal or kingly priesthood. Let me tell you a couple other verses here. It's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. It says, And hath made us, Jesus Christ, has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He has made you king and priest. Revelation chapter uh, 5, verse 10, has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I want you to say this with me. I am a king. Go ahead. Come on. I am a king and a priest. I am a kingly priest, a royal priest, unto God. Revelation chapter 2, 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now there's much in that one verse and in the context of the book of Revelation, but I want you to really begin to embrace who you really are. God made you, made you. I want to take that word for a moment and define it and try to amplify it, try to bring about to us what it really means when God made us. The word made or make, apparently it is a prolonged form of an obsolete primary. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but it sounds pretty good, huh? It goes on though and says to make or do able, agree, appoint, band together, bear, bring forth, cause, commit, fulfill, gain, give, have, hold, to provide a purpose, put, secure, show, shoot out, spend, take, tarry, work, yield. You begin to make all of that, put that all together, and God is making and actually has already made. It's not just a word that is progressive, like I'm making a cake. It doesn't mean that it's fulfilled yet, but that it uh, is, is getting there. It's gonna be complete after I follow the recipe and make it, you know, and so I'm making a cake. This is not God making you a priest or a king. He said, I've already made it. It comes out of a word that is opposite. It, it's like to try to really define this word make, it, it's not so easy for us in, in uh, uh, English. Make, it, it almost has this idea, well, he's making me that, but it isn't at all. This other word, it's taken out of another word that it's its opposite. It says uh, make is to practice, to perform repeatedly, habitually, to single, uh, to execute, to accomplish. Uh, this means that I'm going to make myself learn the piano by continual practice and practice. And 
uh, repeating over and over and over and by uh, spending all that amount of time eventually I have made myself a pianist. Uh, I don't just play the piano, I am now a pianist and it has been accomplished by repeatedly uh, practicing and, and working at this. When it says I made kings and priests, not by practice, not by continual working at it, working at it, working at it, but you are that now. Uh, listen to some other uh, scripture uh, where this word is found. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now see, that, that is uh, something a little bit different than when he said he made us. I will make you fishers of men. So as I follow Jesus, there's going to come a real attractiveness in my life. People will just kind of like to hang around me. They'll be attracted. I'm going to be made a fisher of man by following Jesus. The more I follow him, the more I get close to him, listen to him, spend time with him, your life's going to be attractive. <laughs> See, many times we just take that scripture and say, well, he's going to make me a fisherman, so I'm going to go out and catch some fish. And we try to catch him by our law or by some legalistic act or fear or threaten and all of that. I'm going to catch men. No, no, no. You're a bait. You're, you're going to be so attractive that people are going to come around you, want to be with you, and being in that relationship with you, you'll begin to tell them about the real Jesus, which isn't the law, it's a beautiful relationship. Jesus is the best friend I have. It's the most fantastic relationship anybody could have. We were made for that, made, created for that. And so that creation is uh, following Jesus Christ I made unto fishers of men. Now there's another scripture I'll read to you. It's in uh, John chapter 4, verse 46. It says, So Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. Now, now, that's a really good verse because he did something to water. He completely transformed it. He made water into wine. He made you into a royal priest. Man, I, I kind of want to stop right there because I want you to believe it. I want you to embrace it. So we begin to discover then, of course, a priest. What, he, what is he? What is he to do? What is he supposed to act like, behave like? Well, that's our study. Watch a couple of the previous videos and I get into that a little bit. But I wanted us to really understand right now what it means to make. When he made us, it isn't that he forces us, I'm going to make you do this. I'm going to make you. No, that's not, that's not him. By him being in my life, my relationship with him was instant. I was born again. Birth of course, is a process, woman in labor, so on. But birth happens, boom. That baby's there. When was he born? You can know the date and the time. That's what it means to be born again. I know the date, uh, kind of the time, when Jesus came into my life, I was changed. The Bible said all, uh, everything became new. Old things passed away. So what was the old thing? The old thing that passed away. It's like a person that dies. Many times we say he passed away. The man passed away. The woman passed away. When the Bible says that all things passed away, the old things passed away, what was the old that died? It was my previous identity. It was who I was before Jesus came into my life. When he came into my life, it ain't some religious program. It was a birth. And so all old things passed away. I was in the dark. I was a child of darkness. I was a child of disobedience. I was a child of rebellion. He gone. He died. 
he passed away. And now me, first and primary, of course, were sons, daughters of God. That happened not because you went to church or prayed long prayers or disciplined yourself or fasted or read the Bible ten times. That happened because of your faith in Jesus. Not just faith in that he lived, died, rose again, but faith what he did, the work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to touch on this in a moment, but I want you to believe the fact that you were made a king and priest. When you were born, you were born, and you could look at that baby and say, oh yeah, that baby is a man, that baby is a woman, or male, female, and that baby is a king and priest. Just like that. Just like that. The devil wants you not to believe that or know who you are. So he tries to make you look like a failure. He tries to make you look like just someone getting by or a forgiven sinner. No. You are a king and priest. You were born that way. Now whether you live that way is another matter. Whether you even know it, you could, you could live your entire life. You could live 70, 80, 90 years and die and never know who you really were. That's the tragedy. That's the heartbreak of Jesus, I believe. The grieving of his heart is the fact that, you know, you were born this way, but you never really knew it. Now, I'd like to read this to you. It, uh, something I read that really helps us understand of this new birth. It says the sovereign Lord and King of the universe says that he is choosing a people to be his own special treasure. He made us a royal priesthood and it fulfills his divine purpose. It is said that a bar of steel is worth five dollars. When made into ordinary horseshoes will be worth $10. If you take that same bar of steel and uh, manufacture it into needles, the value rises to $350. But if it is made into a delicate spring for expensive watches, it will be worth $250,000. This original bar of steel is made more valuable by being cut to its proper size passed through the heat again and again, hammered and manipulated, beaten and pounded and finished and polished until it is finally ready for its delicate task. Now we began of being a priest, a king, or a priesthood, but then the Lord, he works on this to bring out us to that valuable person, so valuable that it will fulfill his purpose. What is his purpose on earth? His purpose, the big, large purpose on earth, is that he will reign. He will rule earth, not on his own, but through his priests and kings. So the process that we're going through today, folks, your trial, your battles, oh, your suffering, there's plenty of it, your personal suffering, he will use that to purify, to purge, to bring forth that nature of yours, which is truly a daughter, son of God, but that's just not a, a child just laying around. It is a priest and a king. And through the priesthood, the kingly priesthood that we have today, he will rule on earth. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is that not wonderful? That is, that is a wonderful thing. A priest. Next week, I will talk about the priest and defining him. I will talk about the history, the history of Israel, of how Israel came about. I will also talk about how the Old Testament, the nation Israel, how the priesthood failed, how the king failed. Then I'll get into the New Testament and when Jesus Christ died on that cross and he cried out, it is finished, it was his work that completed. It was his death. He not only died for you personally, but he died 
for all of Israel and the way God related to the world through Israel died and we entered in to a new covenant. That meant the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament ceased, it died, and now it has entered into what we have today is the royal priesthood in the body of Christ. I look forward to our time together. God bless you, royal priests.